Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! I wonder increasingly whether statistics actually affect us that much. I don't think I'm as affected by the statistical reports of crime figures as I am by people telling me that they've been victims of crime. You know, when someone says I was standing outside a, 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 a train station that you're familiar with when I became a victim of moped crime, or something happens near your house, um, if you're lucky enough to live in an area where street crime isn't endemic, if it starts leaching into your environs, I think your antennae prick up a little bit more than they do when you see a front page story describing spikes in crime. I don't know why I've mentioned that, I just thought it was quite an interesting way into the conversation. The government stands accused today of losing, the contro of losing control in the fight against crime. Um, a 14% increase in reported crime. Um, pretty grim figures when it comes to solving crime. But, and it's a very big but. I like big buts, I cannot lie. I can't quite follow the logic of, of, of much of the reporting and much of the politicking. Um, you know that since 2010 in particular, when the coalition government came in with their policies of austerity, it was explained to us that we had to, for example, freeze the pay of nurses and doctors and cut the numbers of serving police officers because of the bankers. Um, and, and some people on the right wing of the media did all the cheerleading that was necessary and ordinary people thought that somehow they were persuaded somehow that they should go without police coverage and pay rises because we had to fill the holes in the coffers that had been left by bankers. And, and the global financial crisis. And you kind of saw them get away with it by trying to blame it all on Gordon Brown or, or, or some of the other usual suspects. And before you knew it, uh, David Cameron had been in Downing Street for about a year and people were saying, stop bashing the bankers, but carry on freezing the pay of the doctors and, and the nurses and the teachers and everybody else in the public sector. And, <laughs> and now we wake up in 2018 and we wonder why crime has gone up, why it continues to rise at almost unprecedented levels. Um, and, of course, the number of offences that lead to charges being brought is simultaneously going down. 90% of crimes, reported crimes, do not result in charges. Um, I, I, I kind of just think... Sometimes when Beth and I are having a chat in the morning about what we're going to talk about together on the programme, you and me, what we're going to talk about together. Uh, and, and one of the questions I, I repeat is, what's the topic, though? What's Because it might be a really interesting news story, right? But what is it that makes it an interesting conversation piece? What is it that equips this story for our purposes together, you and me, for you to ring me in? Or, of course, if you're among the 99% of people listening who will never ring in, the things that will make you interested in what other people have to say, people who inhabit different universes from you perhaps, people who can provide a different perspective on the story. And I, and I sit here always saying, what, what, um, what's the topic though? What's the actual question? What's the, you know, I used the phrase earlier in the week, the oyster knife, the blade you use to shuck open the shell to get at the lovely flesh and occasional pearl that lurks within. And, and oddly, this story doesn't fit neatly into a conversational I mean, it, of course it does. If I say, have you been a victim of violent crime or, you know, some relatively banal question which we can all answer without necessarily having any particular or peculiar insights. But, but I, I, I tell you why I don't like this topic. Is I, I think it's bleeding obvious. I appreciate there will be things that can be done to improve the performance of any organisation without increasing the budget or the workforce. Okay, we, that, that's just silly. It's like what they're trying to do with the NHS now, as they fatten the NHS up for privatisation. Um, your right wing newspaper columnists are going to start pretending that because you've got some crutches in your wardrobe from when you broke your leg three years ago and no one's been around to pick them up. That's the real problem with the NHS, that and the immigrants. It's got nothing to do with underfunding and appalling management. And, and it seems to me that there's, there's something similar is happening with the police now. I, I think Brexit and Trump have taught us all that, that um, you, you can never actually say, no, the population will never be mad enough to do that. We now know that, that, that all bets are off when it comes to self-harm and uh, mad decisions, mad democratic decisions. 
And so I, I, I'm just sort of floating. I'm returning to that idea when you insulate yourself from problems because you've got a few quid and you don't care what happens to everybody else. And the only way you can ever pull that off is by persuading the people who are going to get hurt that they're not going to get hurt. That's, that's where the politics of demonization becomes so powerful. James, what are you talking about? Well, I'll tell you what I always think of. I think of when Boris Johnson was decimating the London Fire Brigade while claiming publicly that he was doing no such thing. And I'm thinking of the free pass that he got to do so. And I, and I sat here on a few occasions during that period and said to you, I don't believe that he would deliberately compromise safety, even though that is what the, quote, experts, end quotes, tell me. The FBU has a vested interest in protecting the jobs and the interests of its members. But Boris Johnson lives in London. And all of his children live in London. The ones born in wedlock and the others, or other singular. Um, they all live in London. Why would anybody recklessly endanger the lives of his own children for political gain? Or, 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 I mean, was it political gain when they started flogging off the fire stations? And I didn't quite get it. And then you told me, and the statistics bear this out, that you are much, much more likely to be the victim of fire if you live in poor parts of town or if you live in poor quality accommodation. It makes sense. This was long before the Grenfell Tower tragedy focused our mind on such matters. But if your electrical appliances are old, if the refurbishment of your building has been undertaken in murky circumstances, if your landlord is dodgy and hasn't checked the fire doors, if you don't even know where your fire doors are, if you live in an area of low investment in things like infrastructure and safety, obviously you're more likely to suffer from a fire-related problem. So you explained to me that the reason why a, a, a politician like Boris Johnson could make London less safe was actually to do with economy rather than security. And the parts of London that would bear the brunt of being made less safe was, um, very simply, money. If you've got money, you won't be compromised. And I, I didn't quite buy it. But then... We move on to the health service and the police. Now, you can have, of course, private health insurance. And I didn't know a lot about private health insurance until a good friend of mine got very poorly recently. I thought for the really, really serious stuff, everybody was treated the same on the, on, on the NHS. I thought it just maybe got, you, got your varicose veins seen a bit quicker or you could have your hip done without going down a 12-month waiting route. But, but it, it turns out it applies also to you know, who you, what consultant you see if you, if you get cancer and, and things like that. So private health insurance, which I think, and, and again, as ever on the programme, I'm open to correction on all of this, I think private health insurance became less popular during Tony Blair's premiership because the perceived benefits of having it diminished as the NHS performed well. You'll, you'll remember that patient satisfaction with the National Health Service in 2010 was the highest it had ever been since records began. They didn't actually begin that long ago, so don't, don't go to the bank yet on that. But, but that is a, a statement, I think, of recorded fact. So I do find myself moving very, 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 very reluctantly towards the... Um, conclusion that an awful lot of the policies that are still abroad after eight years of having a conservative prime minister are contingent upon the fact i mean you look at how jacob rees mogg approaches brexit and tell me that there isn't a fat line of philosophy in the conservative party that does what donald trump does and just considers poorer people to be so fundamentally stupid that you will literally be able to sell them um the tools of their own destruction you, you, you know, Donald Trump this week was saying, oh, I, when I said wouldn't, I meant would, or when I said would, I, I meant wouldn't. And to, to, he must just believe that his core is as thick as mince. And sadly, the core keep kind of proving him right. And I think you get the same with the Jacob Rees-Mogg brand of Brexit. There's no way anyone intellectually can defend what they're doing, but they believe their followers are as thick as mince. So they keep coming out with stuff that the followers who are, they believe, as thick as mince will swallow. And after eight years of having a Conservative Prime Minister in number 10 Downing Street, the police are doing worse than ever, the NHS is doing worse than ever, we have fewer fire appliances than ever, and somehow still there's this idea abroad, there's this idea uh, around the country that it's not because of political decisions, that it's not because of austerity. It's because of something else. 
immigration um, or Gordon Brown or I don't know what else are you going to blame it oh waste and oh and pol police uh, what do the right wing columnists say they, they, they spent too much time parked outside a fish and chip shop that's why the murder rate has gone up or, or they've been doing too much um, community relations work with the LGBT community so that's, that's why they're not solving murders I, I, the, the fatuousness of that level of thinking is, 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 is weapons grade but you see it in your newspaper every day it's a bit like when they're trying to soften up the public for turning on the firefighters in the event of industrial action. They photograph a fire appliance that's turned up to get a cat out of a tree. As if they've left a fire burning two miles across town. And that's what, again, that's what the editors and the columnists and the commentators are presuming that, that these people are as thick as mints. We'll show them a photograph of a fire engine, right, near a tree where a cat is stuck in. And we'll just sow the seed in their mind that they've chosen to rescue a cat out of a tree instead of going to put out a fire two miles away in town. We won't even mention that they could be nearer to the next fire as a result of being out of the station. We won't even mention that it just gives them an opportunity to flex their muscles and stretch their ladders. We'll just use the firefighters and the police and the health service and whatever it may be. We'll just use them as an as a invitation to the people who we consider to be thick as mints to hate on and to criticise and condemn the people who will run into burning buildings when they are <laughs> when we are running out of them, who will be charged with solving crimes when they are committed against us and who will look after us when we're poorly. And there it is. So the reason that I sit here and say I don't know quite what the topic is today is because once you've established the caveat, oh, you're right, sorry, Dan says, and foreign aid, of course. Foreign aid is probably why the police aren't solving crimes. Holy moly. And the reason why I say I don't, I don't see the conversation necessarily here is because you cut the number of police officers to unprecedentedly low levels and then you express surprise that crime has gone up? I don't get that. How blinkered politically do you have to be? Once you establish the caveat that of course any organisation could be better run without budget or, work or, or, or staff increases, you just give that as a, as a given. But the idea that you don't improve policing by having more police officers is utterly, utterly ridiculous. And yet we now as a country appear to have swallowed the idea that you don't diminish policing by having fewer police officers. Ah. 16 minutes after 10 is the time. Um, the far right rhetoric is always worth registering. So they will be saying, um, oh, there's too much attention paid to online hate crimes that's why crime has got so everywhere you turn on the right wing of politics whether you're on the extremes with a sort of alt-right uh, or, or whether you're uh, in the relatively shallow waters of, of, of right wing ideology where they would argue that the police force isn't efficient enough you can save money as a precursor to suggesting that if it was privatized it would be even more efficient wherever you look on the right wing there's a reason why policing is bad that has somehow swerved the observation that you've reduced the number of police officers violently. Hey, what, what have we become? You can sit here now. So, so toxic and so all-encompassing is, is ludicrous, damaging right-wing ideology that it's even apparently a matter of debate on why crime has gone up as police officers have gone down. So all of that is a fairly bold way of saying, don't be so dumb. Of course it's because they've cut the police, and even if you voted for them, now is the time to stick your hand up and say sorry. Or pull it all apart from the inside and explain to me why there is some logic in the argument that cutting police officers and cutting... Just cutting the number of police officers will not see an increase in the amount of crime being committed. To me, it's as obvious as night following day. But maybe I'm missing something. It's 1017 0345 6090973. It's not really a question then about why crime has gone up. It's actually a philosophical question about how the hell we've become a country where they can cut police officers, see a rise in crime, and somehow claim there's not a link. I want to know how that bit's worked. I've been on duty during this process. I've been sitting here going, uh, and yet we failed. Significant portions of the country have sat idly by as the police service has been cut to the bone and are now expressing surprise and anger that crime has gone up. How has that bit happened? I think we should make a list, actually, about... Uh, we call, we, maybe a new feature on the programme, and regular listeners will know that whenever I utter those words, uh, I, I'm poised to forget completely what it is I suggested should become a new feature on the programme. But the right-wing red herrings, the, the things that they serve up in order to get the rest of us to hurt ourselves. So while we sit here going, yeah, don't bash the bankers, 
and they cut the police on a scale that has never really been seen before. Um, what do they serve up instead of, of reasons, instead of proper reasons? So how come people have been persuaded that the rise in crime could be caused by anything other than the cuts to the police? 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. I might, I might make a list. I need to find a pen before I can do that. But you see, you see where I'm coming from on this one. That, that's what I'm really interested in. It's, it's so obvious. It's as if we've managed to persuade the country, the Daily Mail and the Sun and their cheerleaders elsewhere, have managed to persuade the country that, that you know, water doesn't make you wet. It's something else that's made you wet. It's foreign aid and immigration, virtue signalling and social justice warriors. That's what's made you wet when you fell into the swimming pool, not the water. And I, and I find it enduringly fascinating. Chris is in Luton. Chris, what would you like to say? Um, well, I, I was someone who was always not anti-police, but I thought they were quite cynical. Um, but obviously we all remember when Theresa May got up at the police um, confederation like the ice queen and just put it on them and said right this is it your numbers are going to get cut and you're scaremongering uh, when you say that crime will go well you say we all remember i mean i i play that clip out in fact he reminded us we should probably play it out this hour regularly but i don't know that it is what you would call something that everyone can remember because if everyone remembered it no one would put up with what was going on theresa may would probably have been hounded out of office after the manchester arena attack because the conference you refer to she was specifically warned that something like that could happen well, that's it, though. The emperor wears no clothes. I mean, it's utterly ridiculous. Um, I mean, I recently wrote to our, our chief superintendent about the, the, the cut. I mean, this is an aside for drug treatment services. Right. Because you, you've just got... I mean, Luton, it's... Yeah, what, do, what do they think is going to happen if you stop looking after some of the most vulnerable and potentially criminal people in society? If you stop keeping an eye on them, what do they think is going to happen? Well, there's no logic. You know, I mean, the thing is, is when, you know, services in the past, they kept the lid on it. There's no miracle cure. The, 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 you know, you can't just cure people. But what you do is you engage them and you try and give them back responsibility. But now it's just this idea, well, everyone has free will. Yet free will to do what? I and mean, you, you, you know, don't have free will if you're an addict. Well, to, you do if you're given some help. I mean, this is what I used to... Well, it's not free will if you need help, either. I'm not, I'm not being pedantic. No. I just... I, I get really cross with this sort of classical liberal idea that wealthy people don't think that, that, that people born with much less privilege need a little bit of help making the right decisions. The nanny state rhetoric, if you like. It's, it's, it's toxic because it's, it would argue that someone who'd had an, an education like mine is equally well-equipped to make decisions as someone who's had no education at all, and I find that really obnoxious. Well, this is it, you know, and it's just this sort of whole sort of polarisation that we've got now. And, and people, I mean, I argue, I mean, I run a pub in Luton and mm. back and front, it's just like the level of crime and addiction is, is just heartbreaking. And, you know, the, the pe people have just given up. You try and have sort of conversations with people and say, look, you know, clearly they're, they're, there's things happen as a result of. Yeah. And it's just got to the stage where... You know, there's so much cynicism amongst people. They just shrug and say, oh, we'll lock them up, we'll do this. And is you it, point is out it, we've got more it, people in jail than any other country in Western Europe. And crime and going up. 40, 50. Go yeah, prisons full of disgusting spice. Yeah, it's going it's down in Germany. It's gone down in France. It's gone up in America. Um, Holland, they're closing prisons where, you know, because they've got not, not, not enough people to, to fill them. So I think it's so, you know... Is it, is it because we are so... I think the word I like to use is bovine, in that you just give people a target and then you give them a bow and arrow or a, or a baseball bat and you just go, go on then, fill your boots, and they don't stop to think, is this the right target? And because a, a Home Secretary and a Chancellor of the Exchequer or a Prime Minister cutting a budget in some distant West Whitehall office and then that slowly filters down to the streets and all right, some fella stands up at the Police Federation concert conference and gives Theresa May a bit of a lesson, but that doesn't really set the world on fire. And besides, who are we supposed to get angry with? Um, whereas if you talk about foreign aid or immigration or the fact that the mayor of London is a Muslim or, or any of the other red herrings that they serve up, it's just a little bit easier to get people's teeth um, chomping that's up and down. A thousand percent. A hundred. Is it? I really just think that's the case. Where yeah, but you're a metropolitan liberal elite, mate, because you run a pub in Luton. Yeah. What do you know about reality? <laughs> well, uh, I'll tell you what, James. I've you come down to the pub and uh, have a drink in there and I'll give you a dose of reality, all right? What's your best? What, what, what's your best bitter on at the moment? 
Uh, but, oh, well, Oakham's is really, really popular. Oh, Try and have local beers on. Nice. Auburn's, Tring, give them a shout. Um, Lake and Buzzard, yeah, all good. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, look after yourself. Tracy's in Clapham. Tracy, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Good morning. I'm, I'm really nervous. Why? <laughs> so bear, bear with me. Right. I've felt maybe a second time caller, but long, long time ago. And what I have to talk about is very personal as well. Okay. Um, so let me try and begin without getting too upset. I joined uh, the police in 1988, so as you can imagine, a very, very different police service to the one that the public has today. Um, a few years ago, uh, towards the end of my service, um, I became very mentally unwell, oh. and it, that had been building for a long, long time, as it has in a, a lot of my colleagues. Mental ill health in the police at the moment is... I've been doing a lot of research on the public uh, on yes. the subject because I really want to go public with it. So okay. it's um, it's almost it's very fortuitous you're having this conversation. But anyway, towards the end of my service, I'm just going to be really honest. Um, my drinking was out of control, as it can be with uh, a lot of police officers. We have this um, machismo that we've brought into from years and years gone by. When I joined in ACA, I, I joined the remnants of life on Bill, life on Mars, I should say. And, <laughs> yes. and and it was, you know, even as a female, you had to kind of suck it up and get on with it. And um, you didn't, you went up to the bar after work if you saw something horrendous or you dealt with something hideous. And, and you know, you'd have a drink and gallows humour would, would come in. And, and that was where you processed it. But of course, you processed nothing nothing at all and all, all I ended up doing and I speak only for myself was I ended up pushing down and pushing yeah. away and not dealing with 28 years of the things that we see as police officers stress and trauma every, every, everybody it, it, it is it is and you know, rightfully so, the army, you know, have lots of people on their side, lots of people well, backing you say them up. That they, don't um, get, they don't really get enough support, but they get more than the police. No, they, don't, does, they don't get enough support, absolutely not. But they do have people like, you know, the Princess William and... and, and um, yeah, Harry that's true. ...doing yes. what they can. We have nobody speaking for us. And I was very... Uh, just to put it into perspective, I, I've, I've got some details from the Office of National Statistics. I've asked for the updated ones. Oh, yeah. Every, in, in 2014... Two police officers, uh, a police officer every two weeks in the United Kingdom committed suicide. Oh, my days. When I was off work, in, um, I was forced back to work after um, I put myself into a little bit of trouble with some gin and some uh, pain medication I was on for hip replacement. Okay. And I collapsed. Um, I uh, woke up two hours later. I think I was hungry. Um, I only know from the crime scene photos. I'm just going to put this out there. This is what's happening to some police officers in the UK. Yes. I tried to make some food. And um, because of the state of my mind at the time with alcohol and, and prescription drugs, I cut my, uh, the digital artery in my finger oh, accidentally. God. And I bled out through the night. I was just very lucky to have been found by um, a plasterer who was doing some work at my home at that time. And um, I went back to work. I had a complete mental breakdown a few weeks later. Not long after that, I was forced to come back to work because my pay was going to be cut in half. So I went back to work before I was ready. I went back to work. I begged to stay at Rygate. I admitted about the alcohol issues. I admitted about everything. They knew about the mental health stuff already. Mm. Um, I, I was told, this is in probably March, I was told, yes, you'll have a place here for, you know, right near where I lived. You'll have this place here for the duration. Seriously, you know, you're, I was taking my head on the walls in the police station. I was mm. that unwell. And a couple of weeks later, I was told I was being put into a uniform and being moved to a, a, a more operational post, albeit within uh, an office at a police station further away. At that point, uh, after 28 years and knowing what I was going through and trying to recover and from these, not these, drinking it, and everything else, no, they moved I, I me. So it's just miserable, absolutely I, miserable. I don't, I don't, I'm not standing here saying... Ex, you know, police officers, the, the superintendents, the chief supers, you know, all the, the ACPO ranks, that they conspired to not help me. I don't believe that for a second. I really don't. I think the situation has become so unmanageable. Um, you're looking... Uh, I'm not going to... I'm not going to come on to, uh, you know, national radio and, and start and aligning. Are, are we... Because I'm, I'm, I'm very late for the news, but I, 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 yeah. I, I sense you need to vent, and I want you to. I want you to mm. use this as a platform to, to, to amplify your message. But briefly, then, mm. your, everything that happened to you was made worse by the lack of support, and the lack of support must be linked to the cuts. Of course it is. Of course it is. 
Absolutely. I, I, see, I, I can, I'm going to sit here all we used day. To have healthcare. Yeah. We don't have healthcare anymore because of budget cuts. You know, you've got all of a sudden policing changed in Surrey. Policing changed completely. And it went from, from a position where officers were streamed in to deal either with go out, get in a stripy car and deal with things on the streets, or you'll be the one who deals with the prisoners the people in the stripy cars bring in. That was streaming. You either streamed in to detect or you streamed in to... I, I hear I've got to go to the news, Tracy. You've, 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 got, you've got a lot of information across and a, and a lot of personal experience as well. And, and, and do keep me in the loop as you continue your quest to find find out the full extent of these problems. And, and very briefly, I'd, I'd remind everybody else that, that we're also addressing the question of how the hell we've allowed this to happen. And police officers, firefighters, doctors, nurses queuing up to tell us about the damage that's being done to the very fabric of this nation. But because of a few idiots in the right-wing media talking about foreign aid and virtue signalling, we're leaving people like Tracy to, to, to suffer utterly unnecessary anguish. And then, of course... The number of crimes being committed in the country is going through the roof. 10.32 is the time. So, we've got foreign aid. Woohoo! We've got immigration. We've got the mayor of London is a Muslim and he wants to bring in Sharia law. We've got police officers are too busy um, hanging out with the LGBT community in an attempt to build community cohesion or, or indeed virtue signalling. So, what are the red herrings that the right wing serve up to persuade a population that cutting the police service enormously is not the reason why crime has gone up enormously. Those are my four. 03456060973 if you want to add to the list. But, but I'm also, as ever on this programme, interested in the, in the question of how it works. Why does it work? Why does it work? And I genuinely think now that, that we are moving towards a society where health and security are increasingly a preserve of the wealthy. And don't forget that I speak as a champagne socialist. I speak as someone who's got a few quid, so to speak. So when I say I'm worried that soon it will only be people like me that have access to healthcare, proper universal, as it were, um, what is currently universal healthcare, and uh, private police forces or whatever it may be, when I say I'm worried it will soon only be people like me that get it, and then other people go, oh, yeah, uh, it, it, I'm speaking up specifically for people less fortunate than I am, and yet they are the people who've been persuaded to blame foreign aid, immigration and uh, police officers going to gay pride for the reason why crime is increasing on their streets. It's quite incredible. But I've said it before and I'll say it again, the contempt with which the right wing holds its own supporters, whether it's Donald Trump claiming he said would when he meant wouldn't, or whether it is... Uh, Sun columnists saying you've got to stop bashing the bankers, the real enemy of the police, the firefighters and the nurses. And they know that people will swallow it. And that's what I don't know I, I will ever understand fully. Nick's in Wandsworth. Nick, what would you like to say? Yeah, hi, Jim. Good morning. Hi, um, I suppose the question I really want to ask is, hey, and I don't know the information it's my show. on this, so please forgive me, um, is just how... Like, how have the crime rates arisen in sort of in like small rural communities, and specifically those in sort of rural districts that are voted for posterity or Brexit? Um, I suppose the reason why I ask that is because I used to live in a little tiny village in in Devon, um, really small village, low crime. In fact, we used to have a newsletter that came around that said, "Oh, in the last quarter, three chickens have been stolen." And we used to joke about this that it was a, it was a ridiculous low level. No laughing matter. No, no, not at all. But, um, you know, there were, there were few police officers there. There was probably three for the village, you know, and it, that's, that was quite a large area. So, I, you know, and this is quite a sweeping statement, so, and I know this doesn't apply to everybody's attitudes, but mm. I think the question is, is when you see, you know, there's going to be police cuts, they're not going to cut three police officers in that area. That's no police coverage then. So they're probably not going to cut as many police officers from a small village as it's more noticeable. But then in a large city, you'll have, you might, you might have 10 police officers cut, um, that are less noticeable because of the, the scale. And, and then, ah, yeah, so then you're back to that immigration conundrum as well, where the people who are really, really worried about immigration are the people living in small villages in Devon, the people living in the middle of London, the, the, one of the largest, most cosmopolitan melting pots on the planet, are supremely comfortable about this thing that people who don't live in London are terrified by. So you get to cut the police by cutting it in the areas where they're needed with the support of the people in the areas where they're not needed. Because there's a, there's a fake correlation there. Like, yeah. it's, there's a fear of big cities. London has a high crime rate. What do they know. also have? They have a high immigration and a high multiculturalism. It, it, it's a false lead. Yeah, and, I mean, London works on that false yeah. correlation, but this does... I mean, this is England and Wales, these figures, and, yeah. and they do demonstrate rises right across the board. I, I haven't got the wherewithal in front of me to do a breakdown of, of urban versus 
versus rural, but it's certainly not confined to London. That's 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 been the whole point throughout. But that's another one of the red herrings, isn't it? Because the reason why perhaps the Conservatives haven't moved as quickly as they might have done to address policing issues in London is because so many people are happy to to um, blame Sadiq Khan for it. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, a big city has high crime because there's, there's more people, which... So I'm asking the wrong question, then. I'm asking people like your mates in Devon to answer a question that actually... Because they're the reason why the, the austerity policing cuts crime nonsense has been allowed to get out. It's not actually because of people living in the areas where crime is rising. They would see clearly that the relationship between cuts and crime is inarguable. It's the people who can't see clearly that can be persuaded that it isn't. Well, I'd like to see a map of sort of the correlation of crime increase versus, you know, cities and cities generally tend to vote Labour or Lib Dem more so than Conservatives. So I'd like to see a correlation, between, whether there is a correlation between the areas that voted Tory and the areas that voted, you know. For yeah, right. well, I would as well. I mean, there is actually a, a thing you can put a postcode in individually and see what the situation is in a, in a, given, in a given postcode. I, I've seen that. Um, it did contain within a Times article, actually, but I don't, in front of me, have the, the full statistical roundup. It's a, it's a very good observation, that, isn't it? And it, it tallies with a lot of the stuff that we talk about. Um, a lot of the arguments that we hear are, of course, designed to make people who aren't in the, uh, what would you call it, the multicultural melting pot of London, frightened of the multicultural melting pot of London. I mean, you get it most from Donald Trump supporters in America who, who talk about no-go zones and Sharia law on the streets where we live. And you turn around to them sometimes on Twitter and say, no, mate, I live here. You've never left Arkansas, ever. How can you be telling me what life is like in my town? But somehow that desire to be frightened is, is so powerful and it speaks directly to, of course, the policing issues. Um, let me just remind you of... The, 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 what was his first name? Was it Brendan? Declan O'Reilly. The, the, the Damien O'Reilly, a former police community officer, community police officer of the year, talking to Theresa May, the then Home Secretary, at the Police Federation Conference in Manchester. And when you remember what happened in... Manchester, specifically at the Manchester Arena just a couple of years later. These words, for me at least, assume a, a very new poignancy. Damien O'Reilly, Greater Manchester Police. Home Secretary, you'll remember in November 2010, you presented me with Community Police Officer of the Year Award. I say that conference, forgive me, just to show that I do know what I'm talking about. Unfortunately, um, I've worked in inner city Manchester for 15 years, I felt passionate about what I was doing. In 2012, I had to leave. I couldn't take it anymore because the changes that have been imposed have caused community policing to collapse. That's the reality, ma'am. Intelligence has dried up. There aren't local officers. They don't know what's happening. They're all reactive. There's no pro proactive policing locally. That is the reality, ma'am. And uh, Mark Rowley just mentioned neighbourhood policing was critical to dealing with terrorism. We run the risk here of letting communities down, putting officers at risk, and ultimately risking national security. I'd ask you to seriously reconsider the budget and the level of cuts over the next five years. And that is the story here. In 2010, she made a decision to... And, and Margaret Thatcher never did this in the 80s. They agreed to a Treasury demand to cut police budgets by 18%. Next five years saw a drop from 144,000 to 353 right through to 122,859. It continues to fall, gone below 30,000 in London for the very first time. So the question we're asking, and we'll get back to it after this break, how on earth have people been persuaded that it has anything to do with anything else? I go, tiny influences, of course, any system, any organisation can be better run from, from a radio station right through to a supermarket. But when you cut the staff, when you hear officers like Damien O'Reilly, when you see people queuing up on my switchboard to describe their daily reality, how on earth have other people ended up thinking, no, I know better, I blame immigrants and foreign aid? <laughs>